Hey everyone, welcome to the Tattoo Chap. I'm Drew, the Tattoo Chap. Today we're gonna to be talking about community chaplaincy. So you may see that I'm in a little bit of a different background that I have a little bit of a beard going on and those types of things. Well, I'm on vacation, but I still got an interview in with one of my good friends who is a community chaplain to let us know a little bit more of what it means to be a community chaplain. Prior to coming on to active duty chaplaincy, I served in several community chaplaincy roles. And today I'm going to interview pastor and chaplain Andy Persley, who serves both as a hospital chaplain and a community sheriff chaplain. So why don't you tune in and learn a little bit about community chaplaincy and how maybe you can get involved in your community as a chaplain. And if you've watched one or two or more of these videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Doing so really does help these videos reach a wider audience and help them know how to become chaplains, how to serve their communities, and also how maybe their lives can be encouraged and enriched. So make sure to do that, hit the like and hit the subscribe. So let's get started. Hey everybody, uh, this is my good friend, Andy Persley, and he is a pastor out in Forks, Washington, and he's also a chaplain in the community, and we're going to today talk about what it means to be a chaplain in the community. So maybe Andy, could you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are and all that stuff? Yeah, um, my name is Andy Persley. Drew and I grew up in Port Angeles, Washington together. Yeah, uh, Drew is you're you are much older than me, you know, and wiser. <laughs> but uh, you know, hung out with my older brother. But we kind of zeroed in our friendship as we, uh, you know, felt called to the ministry. Yeah. And uh, you kind of went off to the army and mm -hmm. was gone for a while. Then I went to Northwest University and met my bride and mm -hmm. uh, graduated there. And then later went back to get my master's degree there and. Uh, and Angie and I have been living in Forks, Washington, seven years uh, yep. this past uh, Father's Day. So Angie's a nurse. She just finished her master's degree, and she's doing a great job working down at the hospital. And mm -hmm. and uh, so um, this is this is uh, my role. As, I'm a pastor at Forks Assembly God, and then I volunteer as a chaplain for the Calm County Sheriff Department, and also mainly through the Forks Community Hospital. Okay. So, and then I I have. Uh, Three amazing kids, two girls, Piper and Emsley. They were born on my birthday in, in <laughs> 2011 and best friends with your daughter, Constance, yeah. when you guys were next door neighbors. Which and is which then, something uh, that's interesting is my daughter was born on my birthday in 2011. That's right. Well, so <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's, there's something special. There's something godly about that. And then um, also Evan, he's mm -hmm. my six-year-old son, and we call him Pastor Evan because he wants to be... He wants to be a pastor already. So anyway, yeah. we, we're, having, we're living the dream, having a great time. God's blessed us and uh, excited, to, uh, excited to talk with you today, Drew. Yeah, and one thing I think that's uh, kind of cool, you kind of hit on it a little bit, but uh, we've known each other for a long time and worked together in various capacities and ministry and just friendship uh, for years, uh, I'd say for the last 20 years. And yeah, <laughs> it doesn't wow. seem been that long, but it has. <laughs> um, and then- yeah, and then for a season when I was a National Guard chaplain, I was actually working as a Washington State Corrections chaplain out yep. at Olympic Correction Center in Forks, Washington. And I attended your church, and um, we, uh, you were my pastor, and you still are my pastor. So, um, yeah. So, anyways, even uh, I thought that'd be kind and of you're, cool. yeah, and you're an honorary member because yes. you, you guys went to, into the army and you're still a key part of Works Assembly God. So you, yeah. you were a blessing when you're here and you continue to be a blessing. Well, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, in my YouTube videos, I often talk about military chaplaincy and I think um, yeah. those are really important, but there's a whole nother side to chaplaincy that um, I think is underrepresented on YouTube and just a lot of people have, don't really know a whole lot about. And I, that's why I wanted to bring you on here today and um, you and I both worked for Clown County in different uh, capacities as volunteer chaplains. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that looks like from your perspective and what you do and things of that nature. Well, first of all, I mean, you're doing a great job with those videos. These, this, has been, this has been paramount and I'm sure it's been wonderful. And I think you're, 
getting people excited about maybe being a military chaplain. Get me excited about it. <laughs> but uh, you know, community chaplaincy is a is a whole other. Obviously, you've been a community chaplain before, but it's a it's a very volunteer based um, opportunity, mm-hmm. and it's it's almost a sacred opportunity. It feels it feels that way, in, in, and I'll explain why because. Uh, when you're in a community of my size, for instance, our Forks community in the broader scope is about five to 10,000, mm-hmm. you know, um, and everything happens at Forks Community Hospital. Right. Everything, everything, whether there's a death, a homicide. And what I found is I'm a, a Clown County Sheriff's Chaplain and felt a little underutilized just because uh-huh. the Sheriff's Department wasn't. Um, well, hadn't literally got used to the, the idea of a chaplain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I continued that role, but then jumped into the Corks Community Hospital. And we started a, a volunteer chaplaincy program there just with the ministers in our town who'd like to be involved with it. Mm-hmm. And we meet every, we before COVID, we met every Thursday morning and had a, a on-call rotation. And, and, uh, and so community chaplaincy really is, it really is at the core hospital chaplaincy. Mm-hmm. And it's a volunteer situation where you know how do you build up credibility in your community i'll say it right now it's respond to an incident because in a town our size uh if there is an incident like a murder uh, or a a loved one who has been um killed in a car accident it affects everybody right and our community all the firefighters volunteer Mm -hmm. um, all the paramedics for the most part, are volunteer too, and and so these people who have jobs and lives and families are responding yeah. to those calls, and uh, so community chaplaincy has been this opportunity for me to to not just pastor Forks Assembly, but to pastor my community, because mm-hmm. if you show up one of those calls, yeah, uh, all of a sudden you're you're uh, you're the pastor on call, and and everybody in town realizes what you're there for. Yeah. You know? And so. I think one of the things that you hit on is you're not just ministering to that family or the individual that's going through the crisis, but you're also there for the hospital staff. You're there for the police or the sheriff. Yeah. You're there for the firefighters, the paramedics. And so yeah. there's ministry that can take place in that whole breadth of that. And then you have the wider community too, like the family and the friends that know about it. And just them knowing that there was a chaplain or a pastor that was there with my family in a hard time that can be comforting to them when they hear about it, you know, secondhand or third yeah. down the road. I had an incident where a child was run over by a, by a car and my wife's a nurse. So she's sitting there right after work. And then I come out here and I just start praying because I, I, I know it's going to happen. Either the boy's going to live and be choppered up to Harborview or I'm going to be going in. Mm-hmm. And I get the phone call to go in next, and um, and when you get those calls, there's obviously nothing you can do. Absolutely, prepare for you have to. <laughs> you're just going. You don't. They don't give you the names. They don't give you the details. I still don't know what happened yesterday, um, but I was asked to to go. And in the midst of um, being there, I'm, I'm escorted on site, and someone says the child has died, but the mom doesn't know. Mm-hmm. And we're about to tell her, so I have to. I, I sit with her, and then the doctor gives the death notification. And in the midst of that, as we're dealing with family, I'm getting phone calls from Forks Fire Department Chief, the, the Forks Police Chief, mm-hmm. all asking me, "There's an incident. Can you go?" And I'm, and I'm saying, "I'm here." You know, mm-hmm. Forks Fire Chief. I have four firefighters that are having a horrible time. You know, and, and then uh, Clown County Sheriff came up to the lady and said, would you like a chaplain? And, and he looks down and sees me at her feet, you know, holding her hand. And, and it's, so it's just like this huge component. You're right. Everybody needs it. And after the incident, you got to take care of the doctors and the nurses. And, yeah. And uh, so it's just kind of a, it's an interesting role to play. And I kind of started this thing called team chaplaincy, where I have people in different uh, areas of fire chaplaincy, police chaplaincy, hospital chaplaincy, but since COVID-19 hit, uh, no one's allowed to even be in the hospital, you know. Right. And so now you're dealing with a whole dynamic where, where um, there's no waiting room. Mm-hmm. You're just outside, ah. in front of an ambulance, you know. And so those moments, it's amazing how you, they don't happen every day. They don't happen every month. Mm-hmm. They probably happen 
four times a year, but they they call on a pastor and a chaplain to be there for those moments. Yeah. Well, you know, you kind of hit on um, you kind of hit on like a, a story of that kind of that kind of plays in that role. And I remember we uh, you kind of gave a class like three four years ago to a group of ministers. You really talked yeah. about it, like community chaplaincy really being like that ministry of presence and that yeah. calm in the midst of the storm. And yeah. I, I really think that that is, um, I think that that's kind of like what you're talking about. You're not there to fix yeah. it. You're cause, no. and that's not your job. You're not the person that's, um, you know, there's doctors doing the medical stuff. There's police officers doing their reports and the fire people trying to do the things that they're doing, but you yeah. are there just to be that calming presence in the midst of a chaotic storm. And, um, and at the moment, the people that are present might not even recognize uh, how important that is, but oftentimes it's after the fact that they yeah. come up and they talk to you um, yeah. and they share that story with you, how like just seeing a chaplain present, uh, I knew things were gonna, even though things might not be okay, that they're going to be okay, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We have amazing people doing amazing jobs. Yeah. You know, I could never see myself as that police officer, firefighter, paramedic, but there's one job nobody wants to do. And I mean, nobody wants to do. And that is deal with, deal with a grieving family. Mm -hmm. It's that to, to a first responder is more um, traumatic and difficult than the incident itself. Mm -hmm. And so you know, there's no tr real training for this. I mean, I went to a chaplaincy training for a week at a police academy, mm -hmm. like drinking water from a person, incredible information. But there's nothing that prepares you for that. And mm -hmm. as a minister, you walk in what's called the ministry of presence. And somehow, some way, <laughs> you walk in, you usher in the Holy Spirit, and you're there. And mm -hmm. you don't know what to say. You don't know, I, I, what am I supposed to tell these these people, especially if they're not uh, a christian per se but just being there i sometimes i ask if i can pray mm -hmm. but for the most part it's just present and and then when the incident is done you just get all these people to say thank you for being here i feel like i was running around with my head shot though i didn't know you don't know what you're doing you, you just right. wait in the moment you know the scripture says in his heart a man plans his course but mm -hmm. the lord determines his steps in proverbs yeah. 16 9 and that's the moment where you or in those incidents, you could, I wish you could know the details, you can know the plan and strategy, but you don't. You literally have to walk it step by step. And the only preparation I have to run to the hospital or an incident is to pray in the Spirit and just ask Jesus, I don't know what I'm getting into right now, but would you, would you be present? And when a chaplain shows up, you basically are inviting Jesus Christ mm -hmm. to come into this family situation. And sometimes that's a most of the time that's a welcomed um presence yeah. sometimes the way people grieve you depict jesus who didn't save their child or their loved one and they're mad at you you know they're, so you just even there you take on the role of let it out you know and and, and grief is interesting i kind of equate it to like a mud pit you're, you know how you mud wrestle sometimes if yeah. you're gonna mud wrestle you just gotta get in the pit Right. and get dirty you can't just wade in there and that's what grief is like you, do i hold this person do i hug them do i bring them kleenex do i bring them water it doesn't matter just jump in mm -hmm. to the grief and be present in it because when you carry the ministry of presence you're inviting jesus christ the prince of peace mm -hmm. uh, the one who brings comfort to the morning into that situation and you can't resolve it nobody can um, right. but jesus christ is invited into it and so that's that's the key role of the of the ministry of presence. You may not know what to say, you may not know what to do, but you get in there and because you represent you're the man or woman of God mm -hmm. for that moment. And yeah. so that's 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 the role. Okay, cool. Um yeah, I mean that's it's powerful. Like in uh, I know that my opportunities in being in those moments, it's it's every situation's different. I mean there's certain things you say how they're kind of similar, but every single time it's different. And it's really just trusting God in those moments, trusting Jesus yeah. to help you um, be that light in the darkness and be that hope when there seems to be no hope. And that's not just for the yeah. grieving family, but that's for the paramedic that just Man. tried to yeah. do uh, resuscitation on a person for 15 minutes and, and it, that person still and it failed. Yeah. yeah, right. And, um, and it's a very sacred calling, I think. Um, 
and uh, it's it's powerful. Um, yeah, especially if you're the one that has to bring the death notification, which death notifications nobody wants to bring. And I've seen doctors do a good job and doctors not so good. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's something about you or the messenger in the moment. And mm-hmm. sometimes if it's people in my own church, I try to have another pastor deliver that message because whoever delivers that message that your loved one is no longer alive, mm-hmm. you will be tagged as the person who delivered the worst news of your life you know what i'm saying and so you know you know there's been incidences with someone at the baptist church lost a loved one i called a baptist pastor will you join me i'm about to bring this death notification because as soon as i deliver Mm -hmm. he can just swoop in and and shepherd because but the moment i delivered i can't always shepherd you know what i'm saying yeah and 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 same thing for people in my own church I let an officer or a minister deliver, then I can kind of be the pastoral care because, you know, walking in the store five years later, sometimes they come up and say, thank you for being there that night. Yeah. But sometimes it's really hard to look at a chaplain and say that was the person that delivered yeah. the worst news in my life. Yeah, the military does something similar. They actually have uh, two te- uh, when you do a death notification, you have a team of two, one person delivers and that person's yeah. not a chaplain, but the chaplain's there with them and the chaplain goes and um is there to kind of like comfort the person after the news is delivered yeah so yeah that's a good way to do it and that's how we try to tr- do it with police officers too. let them deliver the details but they they would rather do that mm-hmm. than the next piece you know what i'm yeah. saying and and so it's really a team effort cool um so if someone was interested in, in becoming uh like a community chaplain what kind of qualifications or what steps should they do to go around uh, to become to step into that role? I know there's a lot of different types of community chaplaincy, but what are some general advice that you yeah. give or classes that they should take, uh, training that they should get, that kind of stuff? Well, it really depends on the agency. Uh, mm-hmm. Like when we start up Chapel State Hospital, we don't have any training, so we have to create our own. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sheriff's department. Um, their qualifications are are basically someone who has an accreditation from a denomination, so mm-hmm. you're an ordination or a license, and then you go through the process of background checks and and uh, psych evals, and you do everything that a normal officer would have to do mm-hmm. to become a chaplain, because you're not going to be technically one of them, but you are gone through the same process. So. Right. Everything aside from the academy, um, because there is a chaplain academy that the sheriff's department will send you to, mm-hmm. which is amazing. So if you have, if you're a minister of some type, um, that's the main qualification, and then you go through the process, and they, and then they give you access to the department if they if you come out on the other side, and and that, so that's how you do it. So what's happened a lot though is uh, retired ministers tend to be chaplains mm-hmm. because they have the time and energy to do so, and being a being a full-time pastor and a chaplain for the county is is it, what it has turned out to be is they know who to call when it's time. But I'm not able to be in their cars as much as I'd like to be because I'm a full-time right. minister doing multiple roles. But if there's a retired person out there who who would like to, you know, a retired minister, those are the guys that can be in the cars, can build those relationships and do a good job. But through COVID, what we've discovered, you know, is... Uh, the county said, hey, if you're over the age of 60, you can't be a chaplain right, right. now. So that put that put six to seven chaplains of Colum County, which is me and, and another chaplain uh, who are uh, who are in our 30s. So uh, we could we really could use uh, more people that are just willing to step in and and be in partnership with law enforcement because it opens doors or fire departments. Uh, yeah. Fire departments are sometimes even a little bit easier mm-hmm. because after an incident, you can hang out at the fire station and just be present with the guys. Police have to continue to go on to the next call and the next situation. And, yeah. And it's the investigation. They don't have a lot of time to decompress. Yeah, I, I think you're I think you're totally right. Depending on the organization, it's going to look a lot different on what they require of you. Um, there's like governmental organizations that do chaplaincy, but then you have people like the Billy Graham Association. They have a, an emergency response chaplain 
group that's from ministers all over and they respond to areas of emergency disaster. They have different things that they have to jump through, different hoops they have to jump through, but it's all good training. Um, but then yeah. there's like, in, especially like in places like Forks that are r really rural and removed, you know, like you said, sometimes it's just going down to the hospital and say, hey, I want, like, I recognize you guys don't have something. How can we minister and assist you guys to do your job, to help you with your job and, um, you know, bringing health and healing to our community? How can we assist you all? So sometimes it's just yeah. building that connection and approaching and asking, how can I be involved as a minister and, and, Amen. and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah. I think it's going to look different pretty much probably wherever you live and uh, all that stuff. But, you know, if they don't have, if they have someone that you can contact, that person's going to tell you what you need to do to become a chaplain in that realm. If they don't have yeah. someone to talk to, then that's probably the indication that um, you have a great opportunity to establish something. So, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and technically it's, there's a lot of people that would love to, no matter what the religious background, to be in the chaplaincy mm -hmm. uh, realm, and and a lot of agencies will allow whatever religious uh, affiliation. Probably you know more about that with with being a chaplain in the army. Mm -hmm. But if there are, if we can have Christian um, people that uh, ministers, retired ministers, people that are just willing to an example of faith in Christ and to be there present in those situations, yeah. we're ushering Jesus into moments. Uh, where someone may, uh, their life may be changed forever because they, they felt the peace of Christ for the first time. You know, yeah. it's a huge evangelistic opportunity that opens doors later. And it's amazing, Drew, how many, how many chaplain calls I've responded to in the last seven years and to see how many people actually attend our church now or, you know, would always consider you their pastor, you know, right. at least. And especially with COVID happening, you're seeing a lot of those folks kind of come into the fold. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So if anybody's interested in really, really pastoring a community, using your church to launch your uh, your your community pastoring, mm -hmm. uh, chaplaincy is definitely the way way to go. And you can make it whatever you want to make it. It's not right. a. It's not like you have to. Uh, follow all these requirements. It fits in your job description, and as long as you're available to be on call when they need you. You know, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's all that's really required. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, in our denomination, we're Assemblies of God Ministers. Uh, and another way that someone could potentially become a chaplain is um, we, at, in our uh, at our headquarters, you can contact them and you can actually become vetted as a community chaplain. Oh, OK. The worst. But you don't necessarily have to go through that. So if someone is interested in becoming a chaplain, whether it's military or um, you know, whatever, you can actually, from the Assemblies of God, go through some steps to be vetted, and they'll give you an additional certification over your ordination that will say yeah. that we approve this person for chaplaincy in this, in this role. And that could also be something that you could potentially get from whatever denomination you're a part of to kind of give you that additional, an additional vetting, if you will, um, yeah. going to an organization and you're interested in serving at that organization. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, but, absolutely. So that's, I didn't know that. I didn't know you can yeah. get affiliated with assemblies. But that's, yeah. that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and they, and they offer some different support and help uh, in the processes too. So one of the reasons why we're doing this video is there's a lot to community chat yeah. that's just not yeah. known out there. And I want us to be able to, um, better serve our communities, you know? So yeah, um, that's absolutely. why we're making this. Because there's things that I'm learning from you and vice versa, and there's stuff other people have out there too. So one final question well, is, sure. um, and then we can let you go, is is there anything else that uh, we should know about chaplaincy or any other story or anything that you think would be beneficial um, for people to kind of grasp what community chaplaincy looks like? Yeah, I guess, you know, it's, to understand community chaplaincy, maybe you should have a, have stories, but every chaplain has their war stories. So you, right, you, right. you kind of get tired of hearing them. But, um, you know, there was that one incident that that happened uh, where you had to go to PA or something. And Port Angeles is about an hour west of Forks. Mm -hmm. And you were seeing, well, you're seeing lots of Port Angeles cop cars and state patrol coming out to Forks. Yeah, all with their yeah. lights on and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Which is which is rare for another city an hour away to respond, mm -hmm. um, and so you you said you might be called in to be in a 
to go to something. I think there's something going on at Beaver, which is a small town, mm-hmm. just a little small precinct. And before they even call, when there's an incident like that, they're not going to, the first thing they're not going to do is, oh, we need a chaplain. Mm-hmm. So I just got dressed, went out to the staging area, which is the Beaver Fire Hall, hung out with firefighters and the community that were there. But there was this incident where um, there was someone who was shot by police. And uh, because um, the police uh, came to the door to knock on uh, to see that there was a threat in the neighborhood and the guy pulled a gun on the police and the police were able to draw faster. And Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that person um, passed away, but was causing threats in the entire uh, trailer park neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, I, I just decided I better go to 5-3, which is the precinct for the sheriff's department. And I found our sergeant who was there. Mm-hmm. Who, um, he was uh, responsible for for protecting another officer and the community. But it's not like the movies where you, sh- you know, one of my favorite movies uh, shows is Blue Bloods where Danny, you know, shoots somebody and then goes has Sunday dinner. You know, it's not like that. They're, this is there and complete turmoil right of why that did it end up, did i do the right thing did i you know questioning for hours and they have to stay in one place and, and an investigation has to happen and clothes need to be removed and test for gunpowder and there's just this huge process and he hasn't even seen his wife yet and so i i just said you know sergeant i'd be happy to take, take you home tonight and i'll stay as long as they as we need to and he thanked me if i stayed and while i'm there Finally, dispatch says, hey, we need a chaplain at 5-3. And I said, I've been here for an hour, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, glad you're here. Um, and you don't know how to help the pe- these guys just process what they do. It's just it's detrimental. And finally, about midnight, I was able to drive them home. Mm-hmm. And it was a stormy night. And I drove like 30 miles an hour um, on a 50 or 60 mile hour highway just because he was so, uh, the sergeant was just so... Uh, sensitive and just worried about a lot of a lot of things going over his head going over his head what did i do the right thing constantly the same thing that's been happening and and the um i the uh <laughs> help me help this guy what do i need to say and the lord reminded me that once you ask him why he became a cop in the first place so i just changed the subject and said sergeant can you just tell me why you decided to become a cop in the first place as i'm driving 30 miles an hour in a storm and he stops and he starts to think about, you know, you watch cops and those episodes, they always answer that question right at the beginning of the show. Like, yeah, I, I wanted to help people. And, mm-hmm. and that's what he did. He just started saying, yeah, I, I, this is like the circumstance. I, I got into law enforcement. I wanted to help people. And just went through this thing of why he was, he was um, became a cop. And I stopped him and I said, Sergeant, thank you for fulfilling your call tonight to help people. You saved an entire neighborhood mm-hmm. and you saved an officer's life and you saved your own and your wife is grateful too in a few moments she's going to see you and it just changed the whole dynamic of the of the situation right to realize that he had fulfilled his duty mm-hmm. and it helped him through the next weeks of torment and investigation and he used to call me back later uh and say that conversation in the car helped give me purpose and direction when you reminded me why i became a cop in the first place and then he also said every time i see your pickup truck it brings me peace. How does a truck bring somebody <laughs> peace? You know, I don't know, yeah. but it just when he sees that truck, it just brings him peace, and and so that it's just like Jesus again is in the moment. And I think what we need to do constantly, in especially if you're an army chaplain, is to remind people why they set out to do what they did in the first place. Mm-hmm. Because through what we're seeing in our society today, to conflicts and and personal conflicts. It, it can get clouded and muggy and, and just mm-hmm. to bring people back to that calling. It's interesting that, you know, it, it shapes me too. Like a crisis for me is much different than a crisis used to be. You know, right. like a, a financial crisis in a, in, a, in a church isn't as significant now. You know, we can work through it because we've seen levels of crisis uh, on different places. Yeah. So it really equips a pastor to guide, uh, guide themselves and guide the community and the church. So... That's that probably the one thing I'd leave you with uh, okay. today. Yeah, no, uh, that, that incident was interesting because I remember driving to town and uh, I was seeing like 
multiple agencies uh, vehicles just blasting through like in a place where you don't blast through because it's really twisty. They all had their yeah. lights on. You had other emergency vehicles coming. And that's when I was like, hey, there's something that's probably coming down your way. Just be ready. But that's that's the cool thing about community chaplaincy. I knew who my community chaplain was. Yeah. And I was even able to reach out and say, hey, this is something that you might need to, you know. Yeah. And if you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be able to be where I needed to be at that time. I would have been way late. I wouldn't have known, you know. Right. And so uh, God used you and, and God used that situation to, yeah. to really be there for the sergeant and be there for the for the other officer. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Andy, I just want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your day to do this with us. Thank you for what you do yeah. at Forks, Washington. And yes, it is the Forks, Washington that you know about from the Twilight books and movies. And uh, so, uh, but it's an awesome community. I love the people out there. I love Forks, Assembly of God. And um, we love you, their... Drew. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. And we, um, well, we'll get together sometime in the future, but <laughs> yep. maybe we'll have you on here again sometime. But thank you very much, Andy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Well, there you have that interview with myself and Andy. We're good friends. We go real far back. And he's a great guy, a great minister, and really loves his community. And what he's doing in his community, I can see you doing in your community as well. It doesn't take a lot. It just takes someone with heart that wants to reach out to their community. If you have any questions about community chaplaincy that maybe weren't addressed in this video, maybe comment down below and I'll do what I can to answer them or send you to the right place to get those questions answered. And again, hit that like, hit that subscribe, and we will see you next time on the Tattoo Chap. And bye.